about your very first job as a nurse. First of all, is there anyone in the room who's been a nurse for less than two years? Anyone been a nurse for less than two years? All of you are very experienced. Anyone been a nurse for less than five years? Коллеги, ну поднимаем руки. Ну кто, кто работал меньше okay. пяти лет, поднимите, пожалуйста, руку. Пять лет. Спасибо кто огромное. Отработал? Кто пять и меньше отработал, поднимите руки, пожалуйста. Замечательно. Okay. Всегда надо дублировать вопрос или можно самим чуть-чуть инициативу проявить. Спасибо. And how many of you have been a nurse for more than 15 years? Longer than 15 years? Wow. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of experienced nurses in here, but also quite a few nurses who have not been a nurse for very long. The reason why I'm asking you these questions is because if you think back to your, when you were just a nurse at the very beginning of your career, when I think back of that, I think of how afraid I was. I used to drive to work and I would say, please don't let me kill anyone today <laughs> because I was so afraid. And now, 25 years later, I'm a mentor for many other nurses. <laughs> so I think I, I want to empower you to think back sometimes of those early days as a nurse and how nervous that can make you and think about some of those nurses on your unit at your hospital who might be feeling like that. So oh, there we go. So a couple of points I want to make today. One is the importance of goals. All of us should have professional goals, and I think we should all have them written down. I write my professional goals down on my calendar every year. I use a paper calendar. I know all, most of you probably use electronic calendars, but I write my goals down and I look at them frequently to make sure that I'm taking those steps necessary to reach those goals. The second is as, in, as you are developing the role of oncology nurses in Russia, I'd like for you to think about how you can incorporate some standards and some policies and some competencies in your hospital and on your nursing units to advance the role of oncology nursing. So that's the second point. And then the third point is really how can you lead and mentor others? because all of us can play that role of leading and mentoring others. So let's look at each of these a little bit. This is a busy slide. You don't have to read it. You will get access to these slides. But the first thing to really look at is that self-assessment, thinking about for yourself, where am I right now and where do I want to be? Do I aspire to be a, a nurse manager or someone who's going to be in charge of other nurses on the unit? Do I aspire to be someone who helps with the education of other nurses and serves as a mentor for other nurses? Do I aspire to be like our great leader over here who wants to start an entire oncology nursing society for Russia? How exciting is that? So look at where you are today and where you want to go. And as you think about that, you need to think about what are those little steps that you can take to reach that goal. The next thing is a leadership inventory. We can all look at the skills that we have as leaders and how those skills can help other nurses who work with us. And the third thing is a personality profile. I don't know if any of you have ever done anything like that. There are many of them out there. Myers-Briggs is one. I personally like Strengths Finder, and I believe that is interpreted in many different languages. I forgot to check if it's interpreted in Russian. But that is a very good tool to really look at some of the, it's a self-assessment that looks at uh, what it is that you're particularly skilled at. And then you can focus on those strengths and share those with your other nurses. This is a website that was very helpful, and it really, helps you to look at your leadership skills and again to focus on what you might need to work on but also what you're already very good at. So we talked a little bit about goals and this is one of the takeaways that I want you all to leave here with. If, if not by the end of today then I would say within the next two days I would like for you to all have at least three goals set for yourself. 
you need to make sure that these goals are very specific and very measurable. So you don't just want a vague goal like, I want to be a nurse leader on my unit. You want it to sound something like, within the next three years, I want to become a nurse leader on my unit and be able to uh, make a difference or an impact and develop standards on my oncology unit. So something very specific and measurable and have a time associated with it. So there's been some research that showed that as you have goals, so once you have your goals written down, you need to share those with others. So the research that was done was what really helps people achieve their goals. And one thing was having those goals written down. Another was sharing them with others. And another is to reciprocate that with, with that colleague and share each other's goals and hold each other accountable for reaching those goals. And you always want to frequently reevaluate to make sure that am I on the right track or do I need to shift or change that goal? These are some tips for leaders. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but I think these are important to think about as you think about yourself as a leader on your nursing unit. One of the things that I like about um, thinking yourself as a leader is that you can't always do everything yourself. Sometimes you have to delegate to others. And sometimes as nurses, we're not really good at that. So sometimes we need to get better at delegating to others. Sometimes we need to adjust our style. I tend to be a very direct person, but I recognize that some of my colleagues don't really like that approach, and so I tend to try to soften my style with, with, when working with some colleagues. Sometimes we just need to volunteer. As part of expanding those leadership qualities that, that we want to have as nurses, sometimes we need to volunteer to be on a committee, to look at uh, writing some protocols, to help our colleagues develop an association for nurses. So sometimes it's volunteering and raising your hand. We want to make sure that we're sharing information with others and mentoring those other nurses on our, on our nursing units. And we really need to try to focus our time. I think sometimes we get so busy with just the day-to-day, -day, taking care of patients and, and getting through that shift that we don't always take the time to really think about you know, the, the strategy part. The, Am I reaching those goals? Am I taking those small steps to reach the goals that I've set for myself? So you want to have some focus times. And also set those small milestones. You aren't going to go from writing your goals to reaching your goals in a very short period of time. So what are those small milestones that you can measure? So when we think about developing, further developing oncology nursing in Russia, there are a lot of tools out there. And I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, but these are some guidelines to really help you define and really formalize oncology nursing in your hospitals or clinics. So there's, there should be some element of classroom education, you know, educating new nurses in terms of what it takes to be an oncology nurse, um, how to appropriately administer chemotherapy, what side effects to watch for, those kinds of things. Lectures may occur from other nurses who are very experienced to help those newer nurses. And simulation is the practicing of those skills. Do, do you uh, tend to, when nurses are new giving chemotherapy, do you have them demonstrate on, in some way before they actually give the chemotherapy to patients? Do you do that? As for simulation, uh, now we use cardiovascular resuscitation, we use simulation with nurses. As to chemotherapy, 
Uh, there are no simulation as to chemotherapy, but we are going to organize this. The program has been developed and doctors. Two years ago, we had, let, let's say, new drug, blinatumumab, so it's for resistant diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It was new drug, and we were like awarded uh, our center to get this kind of drug. And of course, we didn't know, we didn't know, you know, nothing about it. So. Uh, our physicians from department, we prepared slides and, you know, just ask information from our international colleague. And we just had like small class inside the department that potentially it could be several side effects, etc. So, uh, yes, if we have new drug, we just try to implement and just set up kind of small presentation between our nurses. But I'm talking about national center. I'm not sure about regions. Okay. So thank you for that. You. I, it's something to consider. Um, we used to do this in, with many different activities. Um, we called them mock, or you know, like trials, basically. So as Johan was talking about um, extravasations, for example, we would do mock extravasations, and we would basically role play what happens when a patient has an extravasation. And we use that as a learning method for the newer nurses who are coming on the unit. And so we acted as if a real extravasation was occurring, and then we would go through the steps of what we would do if, if that were to happen. So those are some things that can be very helpful, especially to newer nurses uh, to oncology. The other thing is exposure to other units. So yesterday, when we were lucky enough to visit the center, we were able to go to the bone marrow transplant unit. We looked at the outpatient unit. Um, we looked at the various um, units throughout the hospital or through, throughout the center. And I don't know if that always happens with newer nurses. I know in the US, we don't always do a good job of making sure that our newer oncology nurses have spent some time in radiation oncology or have spent some time viewing a surgical oncology procedure. These are all things that we can do to help our newer oncology nurses understand what all the different patients go through. So I would really encourage, if that's not something that you currently do, to consider having your nurses rotate through each of these various departments to learn a little bit more about what they do. I'll give you a quick example. So earlier in my career, I worked in an inpatient hospital, and I was the clinical nurse specialist for the unit. And frequently, I would be calling our outpatient oncology area to ask them questions about a patient or to do some follow-ups or something like that. And there were a lot of times I would get really frustrated, and I would say, why aren't they doing this, or why don't they do it this way, or why is it that they, they aren't doing what I want them to do? <laughs> and then, I moved to that outpatient area, and I was working in that outpatient area, and it all made sense. So I knew why they were doing what they were doing that was frustrating for me. And so I was able to actually make some changes and to have greater collaboration between our inpatient hospital and our outpatient unit because I was able to see what happens on both sides. So that's something that I would encourage you to, to look at. This is a helpful resource. Um, this is part of uh, a, a book that's available through the Oncology Nursing Society, but it really looks at setting up some of those competencies for your hospital or your center. So what are some specific knowledge areas that nurses need to know? This is information taken from our Oncology Nursing uh, Certification Corporation, and it's, this information is all available online in English, of course, I'm sorry. Uh, but these are some of the content areas to really look at. So as you have newer nurses to oncology, uh, they don't have to be new nurses necessarily. Sometimes nurses have worked in other areas of nursing for many years, and then they move into oncology. But as you look at some of those, uh, the knowledge areas that's necessary for people who are working in oncology, these are some of those content areas. And you might have to enroll the expertise of many different people. You might want the surgical oncologist to come talk with your nurses about some of the various surgeries that patients go through. 
Uh, you may want a medical oncologist to come talk about some of the emerging therapies um, that we may be giving as nurses. You may want a psychiatrist or psychologist to come talk about some of the emotional factors that patients go through um, when they have cancer. So this is sort of a list to give you a guide of the different areas that oncology nurses need to be proficient at. I'm gonna talk a little bit about mentoring. This says successful people never reach their goals alone. And so I really, when we think back to when I talked about all of you being leaders, I want you to also think about how can you mentor others? Maybe it's that, maybe it's the nurse who's new to oncology, or maybe it's the nurse who just went through a rough time with a patient. Maybe a patient has died, and you can be that mentor or that supporter for that particular nurse. But I want, to, want you to really think about that. Mentoring can be formal or it can be informal. Um, in the US, we have very, very formal mentoring programs. And so when we have nurses who are new to oncology, we pair them up with a very experienced oncology nurse. And they work very closely together to really work through until that, that nurse feels very comfortable with her, his or her oncology knowledge. It's really the role of a coach, uh, really that supportive person. It's that sharing of knowledge. Every one of you in the room has so much knowledge to share, but how often do we just keep that to ourselves versus sharing that with others? In some of these formal programs, we really evaluate the results. I look back to 25 years ago when I was very, a very new oncology nurse, and I still remember today my oncology nurse mentor because she was not only the person who taught me many of the things I needed to know to be a good oncology nurse, but she was also the one that supported me. And she was the one who patted me on the back or gave me a hug at the end of a hard shift and said, you can do this. I know you can do this. And we as nurses need to share that with others. I like this quote on leadership. It says, a leader is one who sees more than others see who sees farther than others see, and who sees before others see. I would encourage every one of you to think about what kind of changes could take place on your nursing unit. What kinds of things is it that you think could be better? And then what kinds of things can you do as a nursing leader to help make those better? It could be incorporating a protocol. It could be putting together that extravasation kit. It could be working with one of, your, uh, one of your colleagues who doesn't have as much experience as you do. There's a lot of ways that we can be leaders as nurses, and I hope that every one of you walks away with three of those goals that you're gonna make for yourself to achieve to make your oncology nursing profession even better. Just a note before we open it up for some questions. Uh, if you want to receive a certificate from ONS via email, this is what you'll need to do, and you'll have these instructions. But you'll need to send an email to that email address, global at ons.org, and you're just gonna put in your first and last name, and then St. Petersburg. I'll show you what this looks like. Коллеги, фотографируйся. Фото... Can we maybe they will have this available information? They need to make photo no, in case uh, not I to think, forget. I think it'll, it'll be available. It will, okay, yeah. great. It'll, it'll be available to you. But you'll just send an email. It looks just like this. You'll put St. Petersburg in the subject line, um, put in what your name is, and then ONS will email you a certificate of attendance. So you'll have that. So we're going to open it up for some questions and answers. We have a few minutes left for that. Right. Colleagues, ask your questions, don't hesitate. Hello, my name is Elena. I'm from Karelia. It's Anka Clinic, a chemotherapeutical nurse. I'm interested in the question. You've got this rotation on your department, so you can rotate a nurse. It's impossible in our country because the nurse without certificate is not allowed to work in surgical department. So nurse without pediatrical certificate is not allowed to work at pediatric department. How do you carry it on? 
That is a great question. And the way we do that is these nurses won't be working there. They won't be providing any care. It's more, it's that observation. So it should not be restricted, I, I wouldn't think. I mean, just as we were able to tour the center and see what goes on, um, I would suggest that maybe a nurse just spends you know, maybe it's a few hours in the department really looking to see how, how it works and what goes on. So it's not that they'll be working or providing hands-on care, it's just observation. It's just looking to see how things work. Um, for example, when I used to be a breast cancer coordinator in the U.S., so my role was to work with each individual breast cancer patient on our unit to make sure that she understood what what she was going to go through, what education she needed, what was gonna happen after surgery, how she was gonna care for her drain, you know, all of those kinds of things. As I was doing that role for about six months, I think it was, I realized I've never seen a mastectomy performed. And so I was able to go into the surgery and see a mastectomy performed. I, I didn't do anything, I was just standing there. <laughs> but I was actually able to see what a patient goes through when they have that surgery. So same example with, with radiation therapy. If you, know, if you haven't seen what, a, what goes on and how a patient receives radiation therapy, it, it doesn't give you an, as much information to care for those patients who have had radiation therapy. So the whole point is just to, to look and learn and observe, not to provide any hands-on care. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? So it's with our institution. I have a question to all of our guests today from uh, abroad. How many young people prefer to become oncologic nurses in your countries? Thank you. So if I understand the question, uh, do many nurses want to go into oncology? Is that the question? No, no, no. Uh, the question is... Uh, uh, go and become a nurse. Okay. Great question. And, the, and I'll let my European colleagues address this as well, or Jane. Um, in the U.S., it is prestigious to be an oncology nurse. Uh, and I recognize that that is not the same in every country. I'll give you an example. I was lecturing in Israel, and I got the question from one of the participants, how long can you be an oncology nurse? And I, I didn't quite understand the question. I said, what do you mean? And she said, we only let our nurses be on, work in oncology for two years, and then they have to rotate somewhere else because it's too hard. And I thought that was very interesting. This was about eight years ago, so I'm not sure if that's still the case. but. I've been an oncology nurse for over 25 years, and I love it. And I think, as most of you know, it can be a very rewarding career. But in terms of the prestige, there's, I would say yes, it is, particularly in the US. And part of that is because of the formalization that we, we have amongst oncology nurses. There's a lot of camaraderie. Um, we have an annual congress every year that, that the Oncology Nursing Society supports, and we usually get between four and 5,000 nurses that come together and learn from one another. Um, we have a robust certification program, so I have two oncology certifications that I hold, and again, all of that lends itself to the professionalism of oncology nursing, and it's very formalized in the U.S. So to answer your question, I would say a definite yes. Susie, I was just going <laughs> to wrap. So one of the things that we do um, is we go into the schools of nursing, and we invite nurses' students to come to our Oncology Nursing Society meetings. And if nurses are students, they do not have to pay for membership to our professional society. And what we found is that by inviting these young nurses that have not decided what area they want to practice in, but by bringing them to our meetings and becoming friendly with them, many of them do end up going to, on to become oncology nurses because We've provided a welcoming environment for them, and we've provided free education for them. Great point. 
Got um, one back from, there. From the U Could I just answer sure. uh, quickly? Yep. I think from the UK point of view, I would say oncology nursing has one of the most structured career pathways. So you can be a registered nurse, you can be a clinical nurse specialist, you can be a nurse teacher, nurse manager, nurse consultant, professor. What it, that's how I moved through my career. And I think it is prestigious because the patients really appreciate good nursing. So it doesn't matter, I think, where you work. I've traveled all over the world. I've worked in different places. The patients are always the same. The needs of the cancer patient are always the same. And I think they really value cancer nurses. I think sometimes the system doesn't always recognize that, which is what I was saying about salary and career structure. But I think you should be very, very proud to be cancer nurses. Absolutely. Thank Maybe. you. <laughs> I want to just about the Belgian situation. Nursing is not as popular in Belgium. It's also not so prestigious to, do as a, uh, to work as a nurse. Um, it's like, and it's what Danny said something, it's like we are necessary, we are good professionals, and that's what the society has to see. We are not just people that care for people, we are real professionals, and what I see in this room is like a whole room of professionals, so that's what we have to show the society, and that's all about taking up the voice outside and going to the European Parliament to let us know we as professionals as other professionals. For example, in Belgium, if I see the salaries, unfortunately, my role as a nurse, as a nurse consultant, my paycheck went down if I became a nurse consultant. So that's the way it's going. Because I don't work any shifts anymore. I just work from seven to seven. <laughs> that's all <laughs> that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Ludmila, at the Regional Hospital. I would like to know in detail about functional duties, for example, about shifts and about benefits in oncology the nurses get. I'm not sure. Say in. We are talking about radiological. Are we talking about radiological department or it's uh, chemotherapy? So we use chemotherapy. In medical oncology department of nurses, or they do absolutely the same work, the same job, I mean, inside the department. And the question was, so I mean, because we divide our nurses inside the department, so some of them work only in the chemotherapy room. Mm -hmm. Some of them just work with patients, you know, provide them tablets, just, you know, taking care of them. So are there, first question, are there any difference? And other questions, are there any financial support? Or let's say they go to, uh, or they retired earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start, Jane? Sure. So um, depending on where the oncology nurse works, if the oncology nurse works in a clinic, the oncology nurses that work in that clinic have the same hours as the clinic. They may also be on call after the clinic is closed, depending upon the clinic. In the inpatient setting, the oncology nurses work 12-hour shifts, so 7A to 7P or 7P to 7A. Shift um, report is given from nurse to nurse. And the, all the nurses get benefits depending on whether or not they work full time or part time. Health care benefits is what I'm talking about, and retirement benefits. And then I'll just add to that as well. From an oncology specific standpoint, uh, most hospitals do have some support for nurses to attend conferences such as this. Uh, in addition, our professional society in the US, the Oncology Nursing Society, provides a lot of uh, scholarships for attending some conferences like our, our annual conference and they also provide financial support uh, for nurses to do research so there are various support mechanisms for continuing our professional development in the US 
I know there was a question up here that I, I, you've been waiting a long time, I know. So, okay, we'll, we'll go there and then we have this, this lady right over here. Oh, she's coming up to you. <laughs> My name is Ludmila. Uh, it's Rostov on the Don. I'm the chief nurse of Onco Clinic of uh, Rostov region. I have the question. I'm not sure if it's possible to translate. So it's the professional hazard burnout. Do you have a psychologist in your medical staff? It's not only about the patients, but also about your colleagues, about my colleagues, because I have been working for 35 years and I understand that it's absolutely necessary in stuff because every time I have this problem uh, uh, and now I see that if a nurse needs it, she can attend a psychologist because it's really needed. The provision is really needed. Yes, that is a Excellent point. I appreciate you bringing that up. One of the big areas of attention right now in the U.S. in, in oncology is the issue of nurse resilience and how do we take care of ourselves so that we can continue to take good care of our patients. And there is a lot of, uh, of focus on this area, particularly in the U.S. So. If you look at the literature, there, there are some things coming out in terms of what different people are doing to help prevent burnout or to help nurses be more resilient. Um, I'll just give you a, a few examples. One, and you mentioned this, is a nurse, I mean a psychologist as support. Um, one of the things that we do at our hospital is that when a patient, when we've had a patient death, we will have the psychologist come to the nursing unit and we will go in our break room and we will talk about that. We'll talk about the patient. We'll talk about how that death occurred and did it happen in a good way, in a bad way. We talk about how we feel about that. Um, we share memories of that patient, uh, but that psychologist does help us through that. Um, so that's one example. Another example is we have a lot of celebrations. You know, if a patient on the unit has a birthday, then we celebrate that. Um, we celebrate with our, our nursing colleagues. You know, sometimes, like once a month, our nurses will go out and do something, maybe go bowling or go to have dinner somewhere or, you know, do something fun together. So there are, and I'll ask my colleagues for examples that they might have as well, but we definitely need to take care of ourselves as nurses these are not easy jobs. They're not easy jobs. We get a, a lot of rewards from taking care of, the, of our patients, but it can be very demanding emotionally, physically, and psychologically. And we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Any other thoughts from my colleagues up here? Uh, uh, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say something about the earlier session on multidisciplinary working, because I think sometimes as nurses we take on so much responsibility for the feelings of the patient and their families. And if it's shared in a team, if there's a multidisciplinary philosophy on the unit, psychologists, social worker, physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, pathologists, whoever, if you've got a good team spirit, I think that the bad times are easier to bear but I do think Susie's point about longevity in a career, as I was a charge nurse, a head nurse, on a unit that dealt with chemotherapy. And I, after four years, I saw a patient coming through the door one day, and I thought, I can't do this anymore. It was a young patient, he was 18, testicular cancer, and I thought, I need to move on to something else, and I moved into teaching. And I think it's healthy to recognize when it's time to move on, if you have a choice. If you don't have a choice, then you need these strategies to develop resilience and support. But I think your job as a leader of people is crucial to the culture that you will promote. I can tell that you are a person who is concerned for your staff. And I think if you keep doing that, then you are part of the solution. 
So congratulations for what you do do. Yep. Jane, did you have something? So there has been a lot of research on a nursing practice environment and how that practice environment either promotes nurses to stay in the profession or causes nurses to leave. And Susie talked about resilience. So resilience is one thing that they study. But part of resilience is how you are naturally. So for example, someone, a migrant, who ends up in a camp for two years displaced, how come some of those migrants can rise above that event and go on to live a successful life? And how come others will never rise above that? So part of it's our strength within, but we also know that there's certain factors in our nursing environment that really influence it. One is how we are respected by our physicians. That comes up all the time. What I saw when I met the medical director of the Petrov Institute is he is very, very interested in helping the career development of nurses. That is so important. So your, your relationship with your colleagues, the pharmacists, the other nurses, the physicians, all of those greatly affect the work environment. And the work environment can be measured. There are actual tools that you can use to measure your work environment if you're interested in that topic. Thank you, Jane. And I want to add something small about this. It's like work environment. It's all about safety again. If you have a problem, if you are dealing with some thoughts, it's normally you want to talk to somebody, but you want to be, feel safe about it. I couldn't imagine, Danny, if you like, had that feeling like, I can't do this anymore, that you were thinking about, how am I going to tell this to my colleagues? Do, do they going to accept this? Is this more like a failure of me? So I think this is very important. You can talk to somebody you can trust. So a trust person at work or other words could be a solution. It's a small thing, but it could be a solution. Somebody you can trust. So one-to-one -one person, for example. What we also do is like in our world is like do intervision moments. And it's nothing, it's talking about what's happening, bad situations or good situations, but it's not about not about a patient at that moment, but at that moment we talk about what does this case doing with our team, with the medical oncologist, what is the communication between the nurses and the medical oncologist, what's, what is going on if this happens with our team. And that's also very important that people can safely talk about it, what it does at that moment with them. So you can get solutions, and maybe not directly, but it helps keeping forward to come out with problems and it builds up resilience at that moment for everybody. Good. Great points. <laughs> and go ahead. I'm military chemotherapy as to the workload. During the shift, how many chemotherapy, how many patients our uh, uh, news can uh, serve, can provide care, for example, in the ward of chemotherapy. I'm going to let Jane start with that because she's uh, inpatient. I'm more of an outpatient person. So in our inpatient acute care hospital, in the units where we provide high-dose chemotherapy, one nurse will be assigned to approximately four patients. That depends on what the patient has going on. Is that a lot? That a lot? I hear that. Is, is that a lot, or not enough? Ask him. No, речь идет о стационаре. We are talking about hospital. Yes, in hospital. Yes. Care setting, high dose chemotherapy, bone marrow transplant unit, not outpatient setting. For one uh, or two nurses, uh, uh, there are four, uh, 50 beds, 50 patients. 
Uh, but now we are not talking about high dose chemotherapy. Let's take the department. And command. We are talking about uh, uh, the fact how many patients are under the care of one nurse. Uh, in high dose chemotherapy, I think for one nurse, 10 patients. It's a different thing. It's a huge difference. In the ICU, in the bone marrow transplantation, 10 patients are under the care of one patient. In the conventional department, there may be 40 patients for one uh, nurse. In our institute, in a conventional unit, Because I think the roles are very different, and what each nurse is doing is, is very different. So I think it's hard to compare just numbers of patients because it really depends on what exactly you're doing. For example, in Switzerland, uh, as far as I remember, they have seven patients, seven to ten patients for every nurse. Mm -hmm. But of course, seven to ten is much less than 40. Right. Yeah. yeah. In, in the UK, we've just got a new law. So Parliament has passed a law, campaigned by nurses. We call it the safer staffing law because of these problems. Mm -hmm. In some hospitals, the numbers of nurses is going down and the numbers of patients is going up. In, high, in, in chemotherapy, in high dose chemotherapy, it depends on the, what we call the acuity of the patient. So how ill are those patients? How much attention do those patients need? And then if the ward is not, if the unit is not adequately staffed, that is made public. So we have to produce figures and we have to report if we are less than the correct number of nurses. That then also is a problem because then you still have to treat the patient. But we have agreed ratios based on uh, acuity. The other thing I would say, which is an answer to the back, the lady in the back, is that not all nurses are paid the same money. So if you're an experienced nurse and you can take on more patients, then you're on a higher grade and you would be on with junior nurses. So not every nurse gets the same salary. So there's a, there's a skill mix on each. But I think, Johan, you would have numbers in Belgium for bone marrow transplant. Yeah, in Belgium, it's a little bit difficult. We can't compare either because we have like university hospitals and we have like private hospitals. We see that the staffing in private hospitals is less than it's more like one nurse for eight, 10 patients in a regular oncology ward with regular therapy. If we're talking about high, high dose and stem cell transplantation, we talk two nurses for eight patients, so it's one on four. Uh, that's the same in a university hospital. On the day clinic and outpatient clinic, we see like also one nurse for six patients, and that's also in the, in, in the ward for hematology, is one nurse for six patients. So yeah, it's it much less. But as well, I think that it's important to notice, maybe Galina and Irina support me in this question, that sometimes as well salary depends on uh, if nurses uh, have possibility to be involved in international clinical trials. So it's the same like impact, but of course it's about, you know, English skills, etc. Коллеги, можно чуть-чуть, да, вас очень хорошо слышно здесь, если можно хотя бы... Dear colleagues, please uh, be calm. Participation in clinical trial is a different part of the salary if it does exist. Sometimes a nurse participates in uh, the clinical trial, but it's not officially included into the protocol, and uh, so she uh, is not paid. But the fact that she works in the department 
uh, she has to do her conventional duties and then uh, uh, at the same time participated in the internet clinical trials. I'm from two main city, the oncological center. I'm Tatiana. A oh, huge work is done as to the prevention uh, uh, in population oncology of oncological diseases. Please share the information how you work with population in the area of preventing oncological diseases. Uh, I'll start and I'll let my colleagues um, speak as well. So. Uh, thank you for that question. There is a lot that goes on in the U.S. in terms of cancer prevention, a, a lot. Um, we have definitely shifted, f you know, our focus from, you know, focusing on uh, late stage cancers to how can we identify those cancers earlier or prevent them altogether. So we have very um, prevalent mammography clinics. We have. Um, vans, like big buses, that will take mobile mammography units to people's workplaces. I, I did that as part of my, um, my advanced practice rotation. I worked in a, a mobile mammography unit that went to, you know, businesses, and actually employees would come out and, and get their mammograms right there. Um, we have to make it easy for patients. Uh, so there are a lot of screenings that take place, and those screenings are free. In addition, our our healthcare system is set up that we have to pay a lot as individuals for our own health care, but preventative services like mammography and other preventative uh, cancer screenings are free. You don't have to pay for those as part of your insurance benefits. So the focus is very big on prevention and identifying those cancers early, and it makes a huge difference um, in the health even just in healthcare dollars, if you think about if you can prevent cancer versus treat cancer, there's a lot of, of cost savings there. So I'll let my colleagues weigh in as well. So the two biggest things with cancer prevention are screening and surveillance. Those are the two big things. We know that most cancer occurrences are random, but we also know that some cancer occurrences are genetic in origin. If you know of someone in your family that develops a cancer at a certain age, the idea is that starting at 10 years younger, you start screening for that. So for example, if someone, if there's breast cancer in a family that occurs around the age of 50 or 60, we recommend looking for breast cancer with others in that family starting at the age of 40. So what you do is you take the earliest occurrence of cancer in a family line, you subtract 10 years from that, and that's when you start surveilling the other members of that family for cancer. We also have standard guidelines, so for example, everyone in the United States is supposed to get a colonoscopy at the age of 50, um, mammogram at the age of 50, so we have national guidelines, but a lot of it has to do with education and educating the population that treating cancer early on is so much more effective than waiting. So for us in the United States, it's two things, surveillance and screening. I would, I would give an example of a project that I'm involved in at the moment, which is around HPV vaccination. And as we know, cervical cancer and some head and neck cancers are now implicated in HPV. So if we can vaccinate young people, girls, but also boys, then we can prevent something like 95% of those cancers. And Australia is looking to eradicate HPV-related cervical cancer within the next 10 years. But that vaccine has to be given before sexual debut. So before that young person has sexual intercourse, they have to be given that vaccine. And that causes lots of moral and religious and ethical debate. Should we be vaccinating our young people with this vaccine. 
in the, we are about to start a project which is interviewing young people about whether they would like that vaccine. Because no one asks them. We ask the parents, we ask the scientists, and we ask the politicians, but we don't ask the young people. So we're about to do that. So that's an example of prevention that is scientific and is going to stop cancer. But it, it means we need to take the step to instigate that vaccination program. So, Danny, I will catch up because in Belgium we have now full reimbursement for boys and girls on the age of 12 to have this HPV vaccination. It's starting this year. Um, we have like vaccination programs, but also like screening programs for mammography, cervical cancer, but also for bowel cancer. The last two years we had like it's a little a stool test. Take look if there is blood in the stool. That's always simple to do. It's easy. It's not costly. It's efficient. Uh, but I also think about what we can do as nurses as prevention and, and it's on the long term and I was thinking like we already talked about like smoking. There are studies outside if, if people are like uh, after breast cancer, if they're still smoking after breast cancer, their disease-free survival uh, can be like, like shorter than, than if they stop with smoking. So that's very important. What we can do as nurses is talk about stop smoking with patients. Uh, that's very important, but also like skin care is very important. Like people, they are treated with chemotherapy, the skin is more sensitive. And they told me it's last, like, not much sunny here in St. Petersburg, but mm -hmm. I can't witness that because the weather is fine outside. But I think this is very important for our people that get treatment, sc uh, skin protection for the sun protection. That's very important. Thinking about secondary cancers in the skin. So that's things we can do even if patients already on treatment, so very important topic. Yes, great points, very good. Any other final questions? Yes, right up here in the front. We love that you are so interactive. Uh, we like... Uh... To noon, I'm from the European uh, Center from Moscow. Uh, what's a maximum scientific degree can a nurse uh, receive receives in your country. In Russia, it may be only bachelor degree uh, that only senior nurses need it. Just conventional nurses uh, who work at, at station, uh, they don't need this kind of degree. So we have a lot of levels of nursing in the US. <laughs> uh, so a nurse, you could be a registered nurse with in a two-year program, so an associate's degree program. You can also be a nurse through a four-year or bachelor's degree program. And then the next level would be a master's degree program. Within the master's degree programs, you can either be a nurse practitioner or a clinical nurse specialist, and those roles vary a little bit. And then there's also the doctoral level. And the doctoral level, you can have a PhD with a focus in nursing, or one of the biggest areas of focus now or where a lot of nurses are going to is the doctor of nursing practice, or the DNP. And that's, that's really a, a clinical doctorate degree. So as you can see in the US, there's a lot of different levels of nursing, and many of the schools do have a focus specifically in oncology. So for example, I have a master's degree, and I went to one of, at the time, there were 34 schools in the United States that offered a master's degree in oncology. So that was my entire focus through my master's program. But there are a lot of different um, levels of practice, and I know when I teach internationally in different countries, some nurses will have the opportunity to study abroad and go to the US or go to the UK um, to go for advanced schooling. I don't know if that's a possibility here for you, but we have a lot of different levels to answer your question. Um, I would say I'm quite old now, and I can reflect back on my career. I did a master's degree. I did a bachelor's degree first. Then I did a master's degree in advanced practice in cancer nursing. And then I did a doctorate. Um, it wasn't in nursing, it was in sociology actually, applied to prostate cancer. But again in the UK we have lots of opportunities now 
for the different grades, as I mentioned, if you want to be a clinical nurse specialist, you have to be masters prepared or you don't get the job. If you want to be a nurse consultant, you have to have a doctorate. That can be a doctorate of nursing practice or a PhD in something else. Um, so lots of those people are either doing their doctorates or they have their doctorate. And it's interesting now that, that I am now supervising other professional groups who are doing their doctorate. So I'm supervising a young surgeon at the moment who's looking at MRI for prostate cancer. So it's interesting the way that the supervision is, is changing and they're asking us for help and we're asking them for help. But it's very much part of the career structure to have different levels of qualifications. I think, Johan, you're involved in a doctorate. Um, so in Belgium, it's like quite similar. You need a bachelor degree for nursing and that's we want to go for it. So that's the minimum you need to have. For working on oncology, you need a postgraduate of oncology nursing. So you have to follow this. Uh, and then if you want to do a master, master is mostly if you want to be involved in research. Um, in Belgium, yeah, doctorate studies are not so co familiar with nurses. Uh, that's not so common, but it's mostly in research. It's not in clinical practice. Uh, and that's something we want to change because then you have more people they can choose if they want to go to research or they want to go in clinical practice. But that's something that's ongoing now at the moment in Belgium. Great. Any other questions? Okay, so just a, one last thing I, I just want to say. First of all, on behalf of myself and the faculty, we are so honored to be here and to, to meet with you and, and to learn with you and, and, and talk with you. So thank you for that. Um, if I could just leave you with one last comment. I love the participation and all of the questions and your level of attention. Um, I would encourage you to take that back to your practice setting and ask those questions, whether it's of your other nursing colleagues or your physician colleagues or other people that you work at the hospital with. One of my favorite phrases is, help me understand. Help me understand why the patient is getting this treatment. How, can you help me understand why it is that this particular treatment would cause this side effect? Ask those questions, be inquisitive, and be that critical thinker, not just a task-oriented nurse, but one that really asks questions and participates in that patient's care. So thank you again, and let's enjoy some lunch.